Welcome to Module 5 in Medical Emergencies for the Dental Hygienist. This week you will watch several videos on stroke, myocardial infarction, and angina pectoris. You should also start preparing the PowerPoint slides for these conditions. The reading of chapters 9 and 10 are required to complete the quiz bank questions for the week. Your topic for the fifth discussion posting will be presented at the end of this lecture. First of all, we'd like people to recognize that a stroke is a true medical emergency. And as soon as you feel like you have any symptoms that may be a stroke, to seek medical attention as soon as you can. Preferably call 911 so that they can bring you to the emergency department and get acute care. A stroke is a disease that affects the arteries of the brain. There are two types of strokes. Approximately 10 to 15 percent of people have a hemorrhagic stroke, which the artery actually bursts and you have bleeding around the brain. Uh, the other 85 to 90 percent, it's called an ischemic stroke, which means the blood vessel is blocked off by a blood clot and the artery can't supply the oxygen and the tissue nutrients it needs to the brain and that part of the brain actually dies. What we really like to impress upon people is that signs and symptoms of a stroke a lot of times are quite vague. And so if you feel like you have any symptoms at all, we'd like you to seek medical attention. We'd much rather have you come to the emergency department and have it not be a big problem than to sit at home and have a stroke. The signs and symptoms of a stroke are severe headache, dizziness, lightheadedness, weakness of any kind, uh, trouble seeing, trouble speaking, slurred speech, weakness or numbness and tingling in one arm or one leg or, or both, si both arms or leg on one side for the most part, a drooping of the face. Sometimes a sign of a stroke is just uh, passing out or fainting. The major risk factors for a stroke are a strong family history, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, excessive alcohol intake, as well as obesity. You want rapid treatment for a stroke. Much like a heart attack, we say time is muscle. Well, with a stroke, time is brain tissue. And therefore, the sooner after you begin having symptoms, you get to the emergency department, preferably a certified stroke center, the better for your treatment to start. When you arrive in the emergency department, there are protocols that we use at our certified stroke centers. We immediately evaluate you with the National Institutes of Health stroke scale. We also do lab work, CAT scan of the brain, and then we know if we're ready to do some treatment. We need to have you here within four and a half hours of the beginning of your stroke symptoms if it is an ischemic stroke, and we can use medicine called TPA. That's the clot-busting drug we've used for years with heart attacks, but now we're using it with strokes, and it has shown to be greatly successful. We also use aspirin or some other blood thinners in different circumstances, but the key is to get in as soon as you can and to begin the treatment. About 700,000 Americans suffer a stroke each year. That's one stroke every 45 seconds. A stroke is a brain attack that occurs when there's interruption in the cerebral blood supply, resulting in the death of cells and some brain damage. When cells die during a stroke, skills controlled by that area of the brain are lost. The ability to move, feel, speak, or remember can be affected. How a stroke affects a person depends on what part of the brain is afflicted and how much damage results. Ischemic strokes account for about 83% of cases. They occur when clots form within the arteries that supply blood to the head. The blockage of blood results in insufficient oxygen getting to that part of the brain. Ischemic strokes can be divided into two subtypes, embolic and thrombotic. An embolic stroke occurs when a blood clot forms elsewhere in the body and a portion of the clot breaks off, traveling to the blood vessels of the brain. The clot continues its journey until it reaches vessels too small to let it pass. At this point, the clot gets lodged, blocking the blood vessel and causing an embolic stroke. Say the words Richard Nixon and embolic stroke is not what comes to mind. We're more likely to think of Vietnam and Watergate. 
but Nixon did have a deadly embolic stroke, which occurred when a clot in his heart traveled to his brain. The other type of ischemic stroke, a thrombotic stroke, can also be deadly. In this stroke, blood flow is halted to a local blood clot, known as a thrombus, which develops in an artery supplying blood to the brain. Ischemic strokes are the most common type, but hemorrhagic strokes, which make up to 17% of cases, are often more dangerous. A hemorrhagic stroke occurs when a blood vessel ruptures and bleeds into the brain, compressing the brain tissue. Hemorrhagic strokes can be intracerebral, which is more common, or subarachnoid. In intracerebral hemorrhage, bleeding occurs in the vessels in the brain itself. High blood pressure is the main cause of this type of hemorrhage. If asked to recall Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you're not likely to think of intracerebral hemorrhages. But like Nixon, Roosevelt was a stroke sufferer. In fact, a brain hemorrhage led to his death in 1945. The other kind of bleed is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which occurs when a ballooning of a weakened blood vessel or arterial aneurysm bursts. Blood then spills into the protective spinal fluid around the brain, causing it to be surrounded by this contaminated fluid. If the blood goes into the brain, or if the blood vessels spasm, it can cause a stroke. A stroke is a brain attack. No matter what type of stroke a patient has, it is important to seek medical assistance immediately, as lifetime disability or death can result. Want to learn more? Check out other videos and sources on this site for more information. Acute myocardial infarction, commonly known as a heart attack, is a life-threatening emergency that occurs when the blood supply to a portion of the myocardium is interrupted. A myocardial infarction usually results from rupture of the plaque that is found within the wall of a coronary artery, releasing its cholesterol core into the lumen of the artery. Interaction between platelets and the plaque initiates a blood clot or thrombus, which obstructs the blood flow through the artery. Blood flow to the myocardium distal to the clot ceases with the affected myocardium becoming ischemic. Ischemic myocardium is unable to function normally, becoming injured and eventually dying if the blood flow is not reinitiated promptly. Ischemic heart muscle becomes hyperexcitable and can trigger irregular heartbeats which may result in sudden cardiac arrest. It is possible today to survive a myocardial infarction with little to no permanent damage to the heart if you get into the hospital's emergency department within the first two hours after the event. One of the procedures used to reperfuse the injured myocardium is a primary balloon angioplasty, in which a catheter is advanced from the femoral artery into the obstructed coronary artery. A balloon is inflated, which then reopens the artery. The balloon is deflated and the catheter is removed, leaving behind a metal stent, which is impregnated with an anti-rejection drug to prevent reocclusion. A second procedure involves the injection of thrombolytic drugs directly into the obstructed coronary artery, which act to dissolve the blood clot. In both cases, the procedure is most successful if performed within the first two hours after the onset of signs and symptoms of the clot forming. In this scenario, the patient has a history of angina and begins to feel discomfort. Dr. Larry Prince can tell us about this. This patient had a history of angina when he quickly sat up in the chair and expressed heaviness on the chest, I had concern. Angina. Angina? Got it? You got the chair up. If you just want to lean back and just relax there, Will. Give you a couple minutes for that to take, take action. When he made the statement, Doc, this is not angina, I really had concern. I'm starting to feel numb over here. Yeah, it's, uh, this is different. Is it different? Yeah, Doc, you better call an ambulance. Great. Get on the line. Both the patient and I agreed that it was more than angina. We went into a full emergency mode. We activated 911, got the emergency kit ready, 
Get the emergency medical kit, the oxygen, and the AED, Greg. In the pre-hospital setting while waiting for the ambulance, there are four interventions that may be employed. The acronym for this is MONA, M-O-N-A. MONA is morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. Morphine is classically administered intravenously to manage the pain of an acute myocardial infarction. In most dental offices, neither morphine nor the intravenous route will be available. However, many dentists do have nitrous oxide and oxygen. A 50% concentration of each drug is as effective as the intravenous administration of morphine for the pain of an acute myocardial infarction. At this concentration, nitrous oxide oxygen raises the pain threshold, sedates a scared patient, and delivers two and a half times ambient levels of oxygen. If nitrous oxide oxygen is not available, oxygen must be administered to the patient. Well, we're going to get you some oxygen. That's going to help you breathe better. A five liter flow of oxygen, either by face mask or nasal cannula, will help in the delivery of more oxygen to cells throughout the body, including muscle, brain, and to the myocardium that is not affected by the occluded coronary artery. If no contraindications exist, administer one adult aspirin tablet to the patient, 325 milligrams chewed, then swallowed. Chew it up well and swallow it. Aspirin has thrombolytic properties. In approximately 20 minutes, it'll prevent the blood clot from getting any larger. Always remember that many people have contraindications to the administration of aspirin. The most common is allergy. In these situations, do not administer aspirin to that patient. The patient with an acute myocardial infarction is conscious and feels terrible. Their pain becomes crushing and increasingly intense, commonly a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 the worst pain ever experienced. The pain often radiates to the upper epigastric region, which is the stomach, causing a feeling of being bloated. It may radiate down the left arm, usually as a tingling sensation that occurs in the pinky finger. It may also radiate to the left side of the neck and the left mandible. These are the classical radiation patterns of ischemic myocardial pain. The patient suffering a myocardial infarction is conscious. The skin is normally an ashen gray color. Their mucous membranes may become cyanotic. They are diaphoretic and they're extremely uncomfortable. Yet the most important thing is the patient is still conscious. Even though it's damaged, the pump, the heart, is still functioning, supplying at least an adequate supply of blood to the patient's brain. Once the paramedics arrive on the scene, they'll start an IV. They will monitor the victim's heart with an electrocardiogram and deliver appropriate medications, transporting the patient to the hospital for definitive care. He's had uh, 325 milligrams of uh, aspirin. He says that this is different. This is different? This is yeah. You've had angina before? Yeah. Can you give me a blood pressure? Well. You yeah. think you can move over to this bed for me? Yeah. We're gonna have to move this bar. Move this arm. Hang on just a second. Let's move this arm. So, uh, have you been getting sick at your stomach, short of breath? Yeah, it's hard to breathe. It's hard to breathe. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, we're gonna take good care of you. Have you ever had a pain like this before? No. This is new. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna do a few things. <clears throat> Can you move your arm for me for just a second? We're going to put you on the monitor. We're going to do a 12 lead EKG. We're going to need to take all this stuff and move it for just a second. Oh, yeah. Let's do a 12 lead. How long has it been since he had his last nitro? Uh, it's been about five minutes. Okay. Vanessa, give me that blood pressure. And if it's good, go ahead and grab the nitro for me. I'm looking for a blood pressure of over 100 systolic. Okay, well, my name's Doug. This is Vanessa. We're going to take good care of you, okay? Having trouble with that arm, sir? Yeah. What's going on? Uh, tingling. It's tingling? No, yeah. Okay. How old are you? 55. 55. Yeah. Do you smoke? Uh, no. 
Okay, have you taken any <coughs> sexual enhancement drugs such as Viagra, Levitra, or Cialis? Uh, uh, no. No? No. You sure? Yeah. Okay. No. 130 over 80, Doug. Okay, good. Go ahead and grab my nitroglycerin out of the top half, same place as the blood pressure cup. Okay. Do you want aspirin, too? Uh, he's already had aspirin, so let's hold off on that. Okay. And if you can help me get his shirt unbuttoned so we can get this 12 leaf done. Sure. I'd like to get that done as soon as possible. Do you want me to go ahead and administer the nitro? Um, yes, that's fine. Okay. All right, this is going to go under your tongue. What I need you to do is open your mouth, lift your tongue up, there uh, you go. Uh -huh. Might give you a headache, you're probably going to have a bad taste in your mouth. You may need to get the morphine ready, if this okay. doesn't help. On a scale of Start 1 to 10, your shirt up. We're gonna need it. on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever had, 1 being nothing, where would you say this is at? It's a 10. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're gonna you're going to feel me sticking some stuff on your chest, okay? Yeah. Is there anything I can do, let me know. Okay, doctor. Um, what was going on just before this started happening? We were just doing a routine examination of his mouth. Okay. And he just raised up, complaining of the pain. Just started, okay. He just came on all of a sudden? Uh-huh. Okay, you've okay. never had a heart attack before? No. Okay. You're set up. Okay, well, I want you to hold very, very still for me. Oxygen helping at all? Yeah. Uh, Did that nitroglycerin help? Nah, nah, Not nah, really. Nah. Okay. Oh. Um, just the IV, the IV bag, and we'll hang it here. Him having nitroglycerin and aspirin and everything. You said you've never had a heart attack before. No. Well, today may be your day. All right, Vanessa, just as soon as you get that, we need to go. <coughs> I want to transmit this 12 leaf to the hospital. It looks like you may be having a heart attack. All right. Definitely. Well, I'm trying not to scare you, but it looks like you definitely may be having a heart attack, okay? Yeah. And we're going to take you to the hospital. What would I have done differently? I probably would have administered nitrous oxide and oxygen at a 50-50 rate. It would have helped him with the pain from the attack. I would have probably administered two sprays of nitroglycerin and just managed the situation. A large percentage of MIs occur during sleep or rest, and most aren't stress related. Therefore, it's difficult for us to predetermine when one might occur. I got this if you want to go. Thank you, Dr. Will. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Cardiac arrest is a medical emergency we hope we never have to face. It can occur without warning. If treated immediately, cardiac arrest is potentially reversible, so prompt and efficient response is paramount. The only signs of cardiac arrest are sudden loss of responsiveness, absence of breathing, and the absence of a palpable pulse. In our scenario, the dentist and his team act quickly and do everything right. Watch carefully. Because if you can do the same, you can give your patients or loved ones the opportunity to survive. Mm, what's that, Barry? It's hot in here. I'm pretty comfortable. How about you, Brian? I feel fine. I tell you what, go ahead and check the air conditioner anyway. Okay? We're going to check it out, Barry. The temperature's not set any higher than normal. There we are, that'll cool us down a little bit. Okay, that should make things feel a little better, Barry, okay? The dentist notices Barry? that something seems to be wrong with the patient and stops the dental procedure. The dentist Barry? performs shake and shout. Barry? But as the patient does Barry? not respond, it is determined that Barry, he is unconscious. Right? Airway and breathing are assessed. Head tilt, chin lift, look, listen, and feel are done. The assistant is asked to go and get the emergency kit. Go ahead and get the emergency kit.
an e-cylinder of oxygen is available. Let's get oxygen. So the dentist delivers two quick ventilations with positive pressure oxygen. While maintaining a patent airway, he next checks the carotid pulse for 10 seconds. There is no pulse present. The dentist tells the assistant to activate emergency medical services and to bring the AED. There's no breathing or pulse. Call 911, tell them we have a cardiac arrest, and get the AED. Gretel, we've got a man in here in cardiac arrest. Call 911. He then begins performing 30 compressions. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. The assistant delivers two positive pressure ventilations. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. One, two, three. The secretary four, confirms the call five, to 911 six, seven, and leaves to wait eight, for the paramedics nine, to arrive. I just called 911. The paramedics 12, are on 13, the way. 14, I'll just go downstairs 15, to meet them. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Go ahead and get the pads ready. The doctor and assistant work as a team to prepare the AED quickly and correctly. Look carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pads. Peel one pad from the yellow plastic liner. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press firmly to patient's bare skin. Peel the second pad from the yellow plastic liner. No one should touch the patient. Analyzing. The AED analyzes no the patient before delivering patient. a shot. Shock advised. Stay clear of patient. Press the flashing orange button now. Shock delivered. It is safe to touch the patient. Begin CPR. Third cycle. One, two, three. Four, CPR is five, continued six, following the seven, AED eight, until paramedics nine, arrive. 10, 11, 15 12, seconds 13, until 14, analysis 15, will resume. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. One minute until analysis will resume. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 45 16, seconds 17, 18, until 18, analysis 19, will resume. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. One more. 30 seconds One, until two, analysis will three, resume. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 15 19, seconds 20, until 21, analysis will 22, resume. 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. No one should touch the patient. Analyzing. No one should touch the patient. Shock not advised. It is safe to touch the patient. If needed, begin CPR. For help with CPR, press the flashing blue button. One minute, 15 seconds until analysis will resume. Okay. We've got breathing and a pulse. Let's assist. One minute until analysis will resume. Forty-five seconds until analysis will resume. What's going on? One more? Okay. This gentleman arrested in the chair. What's his name? This is Barry. Barry? Has he been talking to you since then? Very little. He's still incoherent. He is breathing, has okay. a pulse. We've been maintaining him. We did defibrillate him. Okay, let's ED. get some oxygen on him. Hey, Barry, how are you? Can you talk to me? 15 seconds until analysis will resume. 
Got a good strong carotid pulse. Can you take a deep breath for me, Barry? Good, blow it out. Good job. It is important to understand that properly performed CPR often results in fractures of ribs, especially in older patients or those suffering from osteoporosis. Defibrillation, especially repeated several times, as is called for in the ACLS protocols, may also cause electrical burns to the patient. As a healthcare provider, it is your legal obligation during a medical emergency to keep the patient alive until they either recover or until somebody comes on the scene who is better trained than you are and takes over their management. All right, how you doing, Barry? Better? Thank you, Dr. Thornton. Certainly, you take good care of this guy, okay? We'll take real good care of him. Barry, they're gonna look after you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, sir. The heart is a hollow muscular organ that functions as a pump. It pumps blood to all the cells in the body. For the heart muscle to function properly, it needs fuel. That fuel is supplied by blood that comes out of the aorta into the coronary arteries, which then branch into the heart muscle, also known as myocardium. Disease of the coronary arteries has long been the leading cause of death in the United States. Coronary artery disease is the end result of the accumulation of plaque within the walls of coronary arteries. This accumulation causes a chronic inflammatory response called atherosclerosis that narrows the arteries. At rest, the narrowed arteries may provide adequate blood flow. However, we know that an increase in stress or physical activity causes an increase in heart rate and increased oxygen demand by the heart. With a constricted pathway, the increased demand is not met by a proportional increase in blood flow and the amount of oxygen supplied to the myocardium is inadequate to supply the needs of the tissue. This is called ischemia. When a myocardium becomes ischemic, it does not function optimally. And when large areas become affected, there can be impairment in the relaxation and contraction of the myocardium. Angina pectoris is the chest pain that occurs from myocardial ischemia. If the blood flow to the tissue is improved, such as when a patient uses a vasodilator like nitroglycerin, myocardial ischemia can be reversed and the associated angina relieved. Two common acute coronary syndromes associated with coronary artery disease are angina pectoris and myocardial infarction. The patient who has an acute anginal episode will typically describe it as tightness, heaviness, or a constricting feeling in the chest. In fact, frequently the anginal victim will make a fist and hold it against their chest to illustrate what they are feeling. Generally, these patients will have a pre-existing history and they know it's an anginal attack. Dr. Larry Prince of Tulsa, Oklahoma can tell us about this. Recognition of the problem was pretty easy. The patient gave us a history of angina. As a result of that, we asked him to bring in his medication, his nitroglycerin. During the procedure, he stopped us and told us he had an angina attack coming. Angina attack. We followed the usual PABCD algorithm. The patient wanted to sit up and we allowed him to do that. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. That happens from time to time. He medicated himself. Greg, why don't you go ahead and get the emergency medical kit and the uh, oxygen? If you'll look in the kit and get the uh, nitroglycerin spray out, just set it back on the counter. Probably feel it a little better. Yeah. We had our nitroglycerin spray and oxygen available. But the chest pains dissipated. Yeah, that's what. Uh, All right, never know when it's gonna come. Right. Well, don't talk about it. Yeah. Maybe I mentioned the gas price. Yeah, that's what. Uh, I probably wouldn't have done very much differently 
except been a little more observant for the signs of dental fear or anxiety. If I had noticed some fear or anxiety, then I probably would have used sedation, oral, or inhalation, or IV. All in all, I thought the staff was uh, well prepared and we handled the problem efficiently. Do you, do you think you'd like to go ahead with treatment today or would you like to <clears throat> like us to schedule back next week? Oh, let's, I'm here. Let's get her done. Well, you sure? Sure, yeah. All I right, we'll go, ahead. we'll go ahead. Let's go ahead and we'll continue with the treatment, Greg. Take a couple more minutes. I'm good. Okay. If an anginal patient takes three doses of nitroglycerin at five-minute intervals and her pain continues, worsens, or subsides for a short period, then returns, you must consider that this patient might be experiencing acute myocardial infarction and not an anginal attack. Also, if a patient comes in with no prior history and has chest pain, you must manage the situation as though it was an acute myocardial infarction until proven otherwise. In any of these situations, the very first thing to do is to activate emergency medical services. Please address the following questions for your discussion posting this week. In the middle of an appointment, your patient begins complaining of chest pain and nausea. What possible medical emergency do you think she is experiencing and what step are you going to take in next? Please post your initial posting by Wednesday midnight and complete a response to one of your peers by Sunday midnight. This concludes your audio lecture for this week.